In 2005, Sally Ann Bowman was murdered. A young life taken too soon. This was a crime that shook Britain. Sally was born on the 11th of September 1987 in Charleston, London, the youngest of four daughters born to Paul and Linda Bowman, with three older sisters, Nicole, Michelle and Danielle, living in a lovely London suburb of Croydon. Sally was a born performer and she just loved nothing more than singing, dancing and entertaining people. As she got older, her parents divorced and Sally attended the Brit School of Performing Arts and Technology in Croydon, England. She had dreams of one day appearing on the cover of Vogue and had been compared to supermodel Kate Moss. Sally was a talented teen and had also won a competition as the face of Swatch Watches, which she also caught the attention of a leading model agency who wanted to sign her up. Her dreams were starting to come true. The Performing Arts School also was school to Adele and Amy Winehouse, along with former other pupils. She recorded herself singing the Celine Dion classic, My Heart Will Go On, and frequently performed in karaoke at local pubs, singing away to the delight of friends and family. Sally Ann was the complete package with the looks, the voice, and the acting talent, which could make her a success. Now, after leaving school in 2004, she worked part-time as a hairdresser and model. And in January 2005, she joined Model Plus Management, a local modeling agency. She became the face of Swatch Watches and took part in Swatch Alternative Fashion Week in 2005. Sally had a boyfriend called Lewis Sprotson their relationship was one that was on and off quite often as they struggled to trust each other. On the evening of the 24th, 25th of September 2005, a Saturday evening, she'd been having a busy day working in the hair salon and Sally Ann was now at her mum's house relaxing having turned 18 less than two weeks prior and she was still in the mood to celebrate. She was getting ready for a girls' night out in Croydon and at 6.05pm her sister arrived to pick her up and she left her mother's flat where she waved goodbye and thanks for letting her stay, saying a final, I love you mum. That night, they went partying in Kingston upon Thames. Her on-off boyfriend, Lewis, was also out that night with friends. Sally is convinced that Lewis is out and after other girls. And Lewis is certain that Sally Ann will be out flirting with the boys. The distrust heightens winding each other up during the night. They send messages to each other via their mobile phones, texting, calling and bickering. It's a typical teenage romance. At 10pm, inside Lloyd's Bar, Sally meets her sister Nicole and they spend the rest of the night dancing away to the music. Various CCTV images 
show Sally Ann that night out with friends, stood at the bar buying drinks and seemingly having a good time. But by 1am Sally returns back to her friend's home and by 2.30 she decides to see Lewis and asks him to pick her up from Croydon Town Centre to be taken back to her flat. Annoyed at being asked to give her a lift, Lewis reluctantly drives over, angry with Sally Ann. They argue on the way home and spend almost two hours bickering inside the car outside of her flat on Millennium Crescent, Croydon. Unbelievable. Our relationship was, it was good, but we did have uh, quite a few arguments in that because we were both stubborn and argumentative but we would always get back together, always been together, in my view, in my opinion. It's during this argument that Lewis believes he sees a man looking into his car. Eventually, Lewis loses his patience and leaves sally Ann outside of her house. He sees her walking towards her home. Deciding she will be safe, he drives off. But what happens next will haunt Lewis for the rest of his life. At 4.15 a.m., barely 10 yards from her front door, Sally Ann is brutally attacked by a male assailant armed with a knife who stabs her seven times. Her screams can be heard by a couple of neighbors at 4.20 a.m. Hesitating, the murderer waits in the bushes for any lights to come on, but when they don't, he continues. The attacker violently rapes and attacks her, savagely biting her. And as he disappears into the night, he takes with him some of her clothes, her handbag and mobile phone as trophies. At 6.30 a.m., a neighbor who had actually heard the screams two hours previously, finds Sally Ann's body in a pool of blood. An ambulance and police are called, but it is soon evident that there is nothing they can do for Sally Ann. The police team led by Detective Superintendent Stuart Cundy launches a murder investigation and everything is taped off. It is one of the largest ever taken by the Metropolitan Police Service. As they make their inquiries, one person starts to stand out as a possible killer. It's Lewis Sprotson, Sally Ann's boyfriend and the last person to see her alive. He's arrested on the Sunday afternoon and when questioned, he appears to confirm his guilt when he utters, is this about last night? The police believe they've got their man. Crucially, DNA from the killer is recovered, but now all they need to do is wait for a match with the sample. Swab tests are taken and processed, but there is no match and Sally Ann's innocent boyfriend is released. It emerges that the killer may have been responsible for an earlier attack on Sandstead Road just 40 yards from the murder scene. And at around 3.30am, a woman pulls over to use her phone. Having no signal, she gets out of her car and a man approaches her. She sees a knife and holds her handbag as she believes she's being robbed. After saying sorry, her attacker beats her over the head with a blunt instrument and she's only saved when a passing taxi scares him off. And after she's given first aid, she realizes that she's been bitten. She provides the police with their first e-fit of the killer, but it provides no leads in solving the case. Progress is eventually made when the police cross-reference the killer's DNA sample and find it matches another crime committed in 2001. And in that case, a young woman from Purley was making a call from a telephone box when a man exposes himself to her, then performed an indecent act 
and disturbingly try to get inside the telephone box. The perpetrator was never caught, however the victim got a good look at his face. So four years on and six months after the murder, the police release their first e-fit to the media, explaining the two cases could be linked. They believe a further six attacks in the area may also be linked to Sally Ann's murder. But despite three crime watch appeals, two e-fit photos and a £40,000 reward, the killer's DNA and fingerprints, the police still do not have any answers. And they resort to drastic measures when on the 27th of February 2006, they urge 4,000 men in the local area to take part in a DNA screening procedure, which will help eliminate them from their inquiries. Unbeknown to the police, the murderer is back in Croydon and one of his friends asks whether he'll be taking part in the DNA screening. Without warning, he gets very aggressive, asking whether his friend thinks he's the murderer and during the next couple of days, he moves abroad to Amsterdam. The DNA screening fails to find the killer and the police are fast running out of options to solve their case. The breakthrough comes on the 15th of June 2006 in England. England is playing Trinidad and Tobago in the FIFA World Cup and win the match. Mark Dixie, 35, is watching the game at his local pub with his friends when an innocent man just literally spills over his pint covering Dixie. This erupts into a violent outburst. He gets the man outside where in full view of two police officers he pushes him. This fatal error sees Dixie arrested and taken into Crawley Police Station where he is duly processed and swabbed for DNA. This will be all the police need. And two weeks later, when he thinks he's okay, the police arrest him for murder. Luckily for the police, Dixie gives them his correct address. He's been living and working as a chef at the Six Bells pub in Hawley, Surrey. His job could make his arrest problematic. So the police decide to create a story to get him out of the kitchen. They needn't bother. As the two police officers turn around, they notice Dixie taking a cigarette break and they take the opportunity to arrest him there and then. He's calm and unfazed by the whole incident. Disturbingly, one of the officers notes how Dixie's heart rate fails to change, which he finds chilling. Taken in for questioning and still appearing cold and emotionless, Dixie answers no comment to every question asked. And on closer inspection of his room, police make a sickening discovery. They find he's been masturbating to photos and videos of Sally Ann Bowman, reliving the brutal and callous murder. So let's look at Mark Philip Dixie, born on the 24th of September 1970 in London. At 18 months old, his parents had separated and at aged eight, his mother had remarried. He starts using cannabis from 14 and not long after 16, his criminal record begins. In 1986, his first crime is to rob a woman in Stockwell, he puts a knife to her throat, demands money and gropes her. He's sentenced to six weeks in detention. And at age 17, and after the birth of his stillborn son, he attacks a Jehovah's Witness, hitting her in the face, and then attempts to rape her. Police uncover that Dixie has been apprehended for burglary, robbery, indecent assault and exposure over a seven-year period. And during the 90s, his, his trail goes cold. It becomes clear to police that he's a very dangerous man. What they don't yet realise is how prolific Dixie has been, not only in Britain, but across the world. Australia, 1993, he moves with his partner, Sandra, to Australia. They have two children. And in 1996, the Claremont serial killer strikes in which three young women, all blonde, are murdered. One girl 
has her handbag stolen and the other is bitten. Dixie is linked to the case and as it holds sexual similarities with Sally Ann's murder, however, the authorities clear him of any involvement. In 1998, a young Thai student living in Perth is stabbed eight times by a brutal monster that breaks into her home. Convinced she is dying, he rapes her, leaving a vital DNA sample that will later confirm his identity as Mark Dixie. He's finally deported from Australia due to another sex crime, where yet again he indecently exposes himself to a female jogger and asked her to perform a sex act. Regrettably, offences in Australia are not passed on to the British authorities. And back in 2003, Dixie is back in Croydon, London, with Stacey Nivett and their baby son. And after living in Spain for a short period of time, they move into Millennium Crescent and remain there until 2004. Police discover that Stacy has a strained and stormy relationship with Dixie. His habitual drug taking is spiraling out of control, which leaves him very moody and aggressive. Arguing constantly, Stacy finds he gets extremely angry at the slightest thing and she recalls that while high on drugs, Dixie would bite her on the neck after rough sex. On the 1st of September 2005, Stacy has had enough and leaves him. Dixie celebrates his 35th birthday with friends, hoping this may be his change to patch things up with Stacy, and he asks her to join the party. When she refuses, he's furious. He continues his drink and drugs binge. His friends comment that despite usually being the life and soul of the party, this episode has aggravated him and brought on a mood swing. The next day, he murders Sally Ann Bowman. Knowing that the police have now found their man, they, they need to build a watertight case to ensure this crazed killer is taken off the streets and no one else is a victim to his ways. On the 4th of February 2008, the trial starts at the Old Bailey in London. Dixie has previously entered a plea of not guilty to the surprise of everyone concerned, including Sally Ann's parents. There is compelling evidence that strongly suggests this is a lie. Forensic scientist Julie Ann Cornelius informs the jury that there is a billion to one chance that the DNA found on Sally Ann's body is not from Dixie. What do the defence team have up their sleeve? Sensationally, Dixie stands up in court to deny murder and explains his plea. He tells the jury that he came across Sally Ann's body but thought she had passed out. It was only after he bit her cheek and she didn't respond that he realised she was dead. The prosecution team is forced to call the witness to the stand, two of Dixie's previous victims. They need the jury to understand how barbaric this man is, and not only for the attacks he carried out, but also for forcing them to relive their horrific ordeals by pleading not guilty. Police believe that this is probably why Dixie entered his not guilty plea and members of the Bowman family present at the trial are disgusted by what they hear and at one point Linda Bowman, Sally Ann's mother, leaves the courtroom in floods of tears and it takes three hours for the jury to find Dixie guilty. He responds by shaking his head. In sentencing him to life imprisonment, Judge Gerald Gordon recommends he serves at least 34 years in prison. He's so repulsed by the crime that he refuses to even repeat it. He's also disturbed by Dixie's conduct because he's not shown the slightest remorse for his actions.